Dear friends, good evening. How are you? <laughs> uh, welcome to another Europrep webinar. We are happy to be here, to be with you. And uh, I am also very happy because I have, have a, a very dear friend with me, Jaime, Professor Jaime Correia de Souza. <laughs> Hi, Jaime, how are you? Hi, how are you, Carlos? And Fine. good evening Thank to everybody. Uh, how was your day? <laughs> well, uh, quite heavy, doing uh, exams of uh, students exams in the morning, okay. consultation in the afternoon, rushing with the uh, metro through town to be able to get here. But uh, <laughs> I'm happy to be with uh, international audience. So okay, nice. okay. It's always difficult to, to, to go from one side to another in yeah. Porto at this time of Oh yes, at rush hour today. and yeah. <laughs> Happily I took the metro which is much quicker. So. Okay, have you seen a lot of asthmatic patients today? <laughs> yes, actually, not a lot but a couple of them and it was uh, good that I saw them because they were doing well and they had uh, okay. brought their tests okay. and it was okay. Okay, asthma is going to be the topic of this webinar. And uh, Jaime is a researcher and also professor in the um, help, help me, uh, how do you say School it in of English? Medicine. School of Medicine. Uh, <laughs> because University. The, the name has changed. So. Yes, but now it's called uh, uh, School, School of, of Medicine, Medicine of, of Minho University. Minho University. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, I don't, he also was uh, president. From yes. the international, international primary care respiratory group. Okay. Yeah, and I've been also uh, with our Portuguese respiratory group. Okay. I'm still a member, but I'm not no longer in the board. And now I'm just doing, uh, you know, just seeing patients, uh, teaching, and doing some research. And okay. Some and he teach me a lot during my residency. <laughs> that was so long I ago. Have, I have very good memories from from time <laughs> teaching me. <laughs> Right. Okay, Jaime, what have you prepared for tonight? Well, I've prepared a, a, a clinical case, which um, is, uh, well, it's constructed but taken from real patients. And we're going to drive through the clinical case in a way so that we can show what we uh, would like to uh, discuss about asthma right care. So asthma right care uh, was the, the, the title for this um, webinar. Actually, uh, well, asthma right care, more benefits and less harms. But the concept comes from the asthma right care uh, movement, which is a, a social movement that um, the International Primary Care Respiratory Group has launched um, two years ago. And it was officially launched in uh, Porto International Primary Care Respiratory Group uh, conference uh, um, two years ago. Actually, last year, it's going to be, yeah, it was last year. And uh, we, uh, we have prepared propose this movement in order to discuss how we can improve asthma care and how we, we can prevent the over-reliance and overuse of uh, short-acting beta agonists, SABA, uh, because they have been proposed for the step one of asthma treatment in the past and we, we have very good evidence nowadays that it's very harmful unless it's used together with the uh, inhaled steroid. So this is the reason why we have launched this, because uh, since we have had the, uh, the UK report on asthma deaths a few years ago, which showed that people still die of uh, asthma because of uh, overuse and over-reliance of, of SABAs and poor uh, care and poor coordination of, of, of respiratory care, um, we have now put this as a, a, a very important uh, mission that we uh, try to discuss with physicians, with nurses, with uh, pharmacists, with patients, and with the whole society about what is asthma right care and about the dangers of over-reliance on SABAs. But we don't, don't want just to stop and say, well, don't use SABAs. We want to say, what shall we do? And okay. that's why we come uh, yes. with this. Uh, and that's case. the main reason why we invited you to, to be with mm. us in, in this Europrev initiative, because it's really a matter of preventing harm to our patients and how to do more benefit than, than, than harm to our patients. Um, Vlodomir says, uh, good evening for everybody from Ukraine. Anna, good evening from Austria. Marek, hello from Sweden. 
Maria Bacola, hello from Janina, Greece. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so from we have Porto, a, from a, Portugal. <laughs> a very international audience, and I'm happy to have all of you. And um, yeah, we'll try to see with your help because I'm going to not only talk, but we are going okay. to ask you for. Okay. For, and uh, I would like only to, to inform the one or two topics. Uh, first of all, I have already shared uh, the link where you can participate in this webinar uh, through your televote uh, answering. Um, please let this uh, link open in a different browser or in a, in a different tab of your browser because uh, the clinical case that we are going to present it's going to be very interactive and Jaime has brought um, four or five questions where we are going to ask you to vote and to answer. So uh, keep this in mind. Uh, another information is uh, related with the attendance checks for those of you that want the final certificate of our webinars. I will share more at the end of this webinar also a link where you can assess um, a form, a Google form, and uh, this way we will receive your attendance check and then at the end of the six webinars we are going to send you the uh, certificate. And now, uh, Jaime, still a uh, salute from Estonia, on cool greetings from Estonia, and Gazmen, good evening from Kosovo. Good evening Good for evening, Kosovo yeah. too, and um, also for Estonia. And now uh, we may begin. Okay, so let's start. And um, so this, this is my conflict of interest disclosure. I have uh, received some uh, honorarium consultation from some pharmaceutical companies, but uh, the content of today's talk does not include pharmaceutical product information. Um, though the asthma right care received a grant from uh, uh, AstraZeneca, though it was not uh, uh, it was n not conditioning what we said. This is a movement that was created by the, the uh, IPCRG. So let's start with the case study about asthma. So we have uh, a consultation, and uh, it's a normal consultation between um, a doctor and a patient. Uh, Jane is the patient, and Jane comes to the, an appointment, comes to visit Dr. Taylor, and she has been experiencing some recent issues with her asthma. So, as usual, we should start by exploring patient background and history before uh, we know, in order to know more about Jane. So, Dr. Taylor must first explore Jane's background and medical history. So, let's look at, at Jane's background. And uh, Jane is recalling her story to Dr. Taylor. Um, Jane uh, is a 36 year old and, and works as a secretary. She lives in a flat in a suburban area with her husband and daughter. And her mother has asthma, and so does her seven-year-old daughter. So this is the basic uh, 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 information that she recalled uh, Dr. Taylor. We can also check her medical history. So let's uh, see a little bit. Uh, Jane has had asthma since she was uh, three. She's allergic to house dust mites and uh, pollens. She has no allergic rhinitis. So we know that there is a confirmed allergy. Um, she has used her um, uh, control inhalers during most of her past, uh, the, uh, the past year, and her asthma appears to be well controlled. So because she has had asthma well controlled, this made her reduce uh, or discontinue the inhaled steroids. It's often happening with patients when patients uh, feel very well uh, they say, well, I'm okay, and they stop their in inhaled uh, treatment. Um, she had a spirometry with a positive uh, reversibility test two years ago, so we can confirm that it was asthma. Uh, and during the last uh, three years, she has had one or more two, uh, one, sorry, one or two exacerbations per year. Um, these exacerbations were usually triggered by viral infections of the upper respiratory tract. A year and a half ago, one exacerbation uh, required oral corticosteroids. So uh, last summer, um, 
when the pollen count was particularly high, she felt uh, chest tightness and breathlessness for about two weeks. Her usual medication is uh, 125 microgram of fluticasone dry powder twice daily and salbutamol as needed. So this is a classic treatment uh, that, that many uh, asthma patients do have for step two. And uh, she often only uses the fluticasone once a day and often completely forgets it. And she likes to use her salbutamol because she feels well with it. So this is also typical. Patients, we prefer to use the reliever than using the controller. Okay, so um, let's try to move on and see about the clinical assessment and symptoms. So now uh, we'd like you to consider voting about this. Uh, we'd like your help in, in asking what else does Dr. Taylor need to check about Jane's asthma? So from these six boxes below, you should choose four of them as key priorities that uh, she needs to know about Jane's asthma symptoms and triggers. I believe that you can only vote on one or with this system, yes. but if you pick one of them with the whole people, I think we'll find out the four most important of these six. So um, I'll move on um, because you'll have this re Just a moment. I repeated. I, I have to, we, we have a, a slight delay, so we are going to, uh, we have to wait. And um, so let's see the main options that, yes, now you can move on for so the televoting question. The televoting question. Yes. question. So the four key priorities Dr. Taylor needs to know about Jane's asthma symptoms and triggers. One, check for isolated cough with no other respiratory symptoms. Two, check for chronic production of sputum. Three, check if symptoms vary over time and in intensity. Four, check if symptoms are often worse at night or in the early morning. Five, check for asthma triggers. And six, check if there is more than one type of symptom. Okay, you can move to the next slide, please. And about around 40% of 38, 40, uh, answered check if symptoms vary over time and intensity. Then the second more answered uh, hypothesis was check for asthma triggers. And the third one, check if symptoms are often worse at night or in the early morning. Your comments to our colleagues' answers? I'm, I'm going back to the, to the slides to show you. Uh, I think that uh, uh, it's very good that nobody chose the, uh, the second answer, B, because that's not typical of asthma. It's more typical of other respiratory diseases, namely COPD and other. And the majority uh, went for C, D, and D. Um, the four that I would have suggested were C, D, E, and F, and I'm going to try to go back and see why, uh, why I would uh, say so. So let's choose. So this is actually not typical of asthma. So yeah, uh, isolated cough with no other respiratory symptoms is much less typical. So, so that's why many people who chose, uh, uh, where is it, is more than one symptom one type of symptom, namely the four typical symptoms of asthma with shortness of uh, breath, cough, and chest tightness, which are the typical. So the majority of people, um, well, a lot of people chose this, though the majority, I think, went for others. Nobody chose this, and I think it was right, because it's not typical of asthma. This is uh, very typical asthma. Many people chose this. Actually, the variety, uh, the, 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 sorry, the variation over time uh, and the intensity of symptoms is very typical of asthma. It can change the same day, over the week, over the month, and, and uh, over the lifespans. Many people have had symptoms of asthma for some years in, in their lives, and they have uh, very a long periods uh, uh, with uh, absence of symptoms. It does not mean that the disease is not active, but that they don't feel, and, and then it can reappear uh, under certain circumstances later in life. Again, uh, Night symptoms are quite typical of asthma, or in early morning, more frequently than during the day, and f the symptoms that are triggered by viral infections, exercise, of, uh, or allergen exposure. So these were the four that I would like you to retain. So let's look at uh, the asthma, asthma triggers, and this is uh, the main asthma triggers. We have here, uh, as you, you mentioned, upper respiratory tract infections, 
exercise, exposure to house dust mites, flowers, pollen, pets, some medications, you mustn't forget about that. Smoking, either uh, people who smoke or exposure to secondhand smoking. And don't also forget people who are exposed, maybe much less in Europe than in other parts of the world, but at least 50% of the households in the whole world still use biomass fuels for cooking and for heating their houses. 50% of the households, it means that the majority or a big part of the population in the world are exposed to other kinds of smoke, not necessarily only cigarette smoking. Is, is the, the air conditioning devices also associated it, with it? It's associated for several reasons. One is the cold air and sometimes because the, the filters are not washed and they can be fungus in the, in the filter. So that's one of the reasons why they can trigger also uh, um, asthma attacks. And of course, exposure to bacteria as well as virus, as, as we mentioned. So air pollution, don't forget. And we're talking about outdoor, but I also mentioned the indoor air pollution from biomass fuels. So all these are, um, uh, and some psychological triggers. Then let's look also at asthma symptoms hotspots. The traditional asthma symptoms, that, as I mentioned, are these chest tightness, breathlessness, wheezing and cough. Um, very often, when we examine patients uh, with asthma out of their um, uh, 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 acute phases, we don't find anything. But during the, the acute phases or when the people are symptomatic, we have uh, breathlessness, tachycardia, audible wheezing. Uh, sometimes the topic findings like rhinitis or eczema is very typical. And people can say that symptoms are often worse at night or in the morning when waking. One of the things that we have to, to, to keep in mind is that there is inflammation, which is a, the, the, the typical event in asthma. It, low, it, it, it is constant inflammation, though with different expressions of the inflammation uh, over, the t over time. But uh, also, when uh, asthma is poorly controlled and, and untreated, and with time, there is the, the, a, a phenomenon called remodeling. Uh, and, and which means that the, the, the symptoms that are associated with variable expiratory airflow and inflammation subsequently lead to bronchoconstriction, which is called airway narrowing, airway uh, wall thickening and increased mucus and can make it so that in very severe asthma, which is not properly treated, with time there is no more uh, bronchodilation. And so if you do a spirometry, it has a, a spirometry behavior like a, a COPD, uh, though it, uh, it is uh, not COPD, it's asthma. So this is very important to know that uh, it's very important to look at history of uh, patient's history to know about pre uh, previous uh, findings in the clinical history, in previous uh, spirometry years ago, and also when people have had asthma attacks that are reversed by the use of bronchodilators. So this is um, reminding some of the clinical regarding to asthma. And then also a very important thing is that there is a need to do assessment of symptom control. And uh, uh, when you look at that, Gina suggests that we do it in, 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 uh, in different aspects. Um, we have to look at asthma control in two domains, assess symptoms control over the last four weeks. Why four weeks? Because of uh, memory bias. People will forget that more than that. Some people have found to retain on information about the last four weeks. And also, a very important thing is assess risk factors for poor outcomes, uh, including low lung function, and we'll look a little bit about, uh, about that. It's also important to look at treatment issues, including the inhaler technique and adherence, uh, asking about side effects. Um, but we'll come back to that. Let's look first at uh, uh, asthma management goals according to Gina. So we have double uh, um, uh, importance about symptom control and risk reduction. Um, regarding symptom control, we want to achieve good control of symptoms and to maintain normal activity levels, meaning that any person with asthma, unless people with very severe asthma, uh, who have not pro been properly treated yet, everybody who has asthma can do a normal life, including normal physical activity. We have lots of uh, 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 sports people who have been uh, athletes who have been uh, tr properly treated and have uh, uh, lived with their asthma, and they reach very important uh, gold medals in Olympics like uh, Phelps and others who have been uh, uh, Beckham, the, fo the football player Beckham who has asthma and, and others. Another important thing is to look at, at risk reduction. And risk reduction in, uh, has a goal is to minimize future risk of exacerbations, the risk for fixed airflow limitation 
and also because uh, of the need to increase doses for medication side effects that are uh, in, uh, 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 showing up when we have uh, um, uh, more severe asthma treated uh, with uh, um, higher doses of inhaled steroids and uh, uh, bronchodilators. Uh, to achieve these goals, this requires a partnership between patients and their healthcare providers. Okay, so um, this is the typical um, uh, cycle that we should follow in asthma. We have to assess, then we have to adjust treatment and review the, the response. And this is constantly done, consultation after consultation. So we, don't, we have to confirm diagnosis, to, to look at symptom control, about risk factors, check comorbidities that can be treated that can interfere with asthma treatment, Look at inhaler technique and adherence. And in inhaler technique, we, we have to know that patients over time will forget the technique, so we have to review and correct the technique all the time. Look at patient goals, what patients would like to achieve uh, by treating their asthma. Then we have to adjust treatment by treating uh, modifiable risk factors and comorbidities. We have to have non-pharmacological strategy. It's not only about re giving drugs. There's a lot to do. Uh, patient education, and in case of children, uh, the, the people who care for the child, uh, the parents or any carers should be educated and do the skills training, review asthma medications, and then we have to review the response by checking symptoms, symptoms uh, checking exacerbations, side effects, looking at lung function and patient satisfaction. So now we can go back to here and check, okay, um, um, we have done about symptom control. This is what uh, Gina suggests about Gina con uh, symptom control. Very easy questions uh, about symptom control, but we can go further than that and look at uh, CARAT. CARAT is a control for logic rhinitis asthma test. It was developed in Portugal. It looks not only at asthma, but also uh, at uh, 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 rhinitis. So it has four questions directed for, to the upper respiratory tract and uh, 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 six to the lower respiratory tract, and there's a score. It has been validated. It has been translated in many languages and many uh, other um, research papers to validate cutoffs and, and, uh, and minimum uh, significant uh, difference, clinical difference, uh, has been done also in the Netherlands and Germany. So we have been working in different parts of, of Europe with uh, the translations of Karat, who has been now translated in many languages. With Karat, we can assess very easily uh, asthma control, but also to look at uh, rhinitis because 70% of patients with asthma will also have uh, allergic rhinitis. So it's very important to look at both at the same time because the, the control of rhinitis can help improving the asthma control. You can also look at the old asthma control test. Um, in UK, they use the Royal College Physician three questions, which is also possible. It gives us a, a, a score. I was uh, suggest people to use, uh, uh, sorry, to use uh, um, uh, um, uh, CARAT because it's really uh, um, clinically more, uh, giving you more information than others, but people should be free to use it, any test, but it's important to check, and, and it's more important to check through a questionnaire, a symptom questionnaire, than just doing a, a check on the pulmonary respiratory function, because many patients might have a, 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 a normal FEV1 or a, a peak, uh, peak flow in, during consultation, but last evening or two days ago, they were wheezing, and they were wheezing only during the night, and, and now uh, uh, you, don't, you don't have any symptoms when you are in, uh, in front of the doctor. So uh, it's very important to look at assessment of symptom control. Okay. Another important thing just, is to... Just to let you know, I have here some questions. When you feel it's a good opportunity, uh, we, I can share with you. Maybe you should leave the questions for the end, so we should, or... Yes, yeah, do you prefer? I would prefer, because I would, many of the questions will be answered through these, okay. perhaps. So. Okay. Another important thing is that people should get out of the consultation with a personalized asthma action plan. Um, it's, it's very confusing. Uh, to give instructions, oral instructions to patients who have to take a medicine in a certain way when they have a certain uh, set of symptoms and then another way when they have another set of symptoms. So written it down, uh, it's extremely important. And the overall aim of a written uh, PAP is to help take early action. So it's also meant to have information to, of what to do when patients start having a uh, change in symptoms that show that there is an uh, asthma attack might be eminent, so they will uh, use uh, a preventer in a higher dose. 
And so this is one of the shapes that you can have a personalized asthma action plan. You can find a lot of these if you, if you type PEP and, 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 and look into, in the net, many similar to this. So you have the green area, that's what the patient does every day. Yellow area, is that's when patient with a certain uh, number of symptoms or a change in their uh, uh, respiratory function should do at home to minimize uh, the, the symptoms. And when they cannot control it by themselves, what to do and where to go, first to the, the, the doctor or to go to an emergency services. So this is uh, the, the typical uh, uh, traffic light, uh, 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 green, yellow and red colors that you use for uh, 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 helping patients to uh, self-manage uh, their asthma. And finally, we'll get comorbidities. The main, most common comorbidities are listed here. So don't forget that comorbidities should be identified because they may contribute to respiratory symptoms, also to flare-ups, to uh, uh, acute uh, uh, exacerbations, and also to poor quality of life. And treating comorbidities may also complicate asthma management. So when we are treating them, some, some of the treatments might complicate, but also treating them might minimize and help us to control asthma. So here are the most typical ones. Rhinitis is the most frequent comorbidity uh, and also chronic rhinosinusitis, but also gastroesophageal reflux, obesity, uh, sleep apnea, those are the most important. But also, don't forget that asthma can, can uh, uh, coexist with COPD. That's what's called asthma-COPD overlap. And when we have asthma uh, uh, together with COPD, it's a challenge for the treatment, which it's not the object of this uh, webinar, but can be discussed uh, maybe later on. So. Let's go back to our um, patient and see. Perhaps now we'd like to look at the physical examination and we look, okay, we have done the clinical assessment and symptoms. We look at the uh, examination. So here is uh, some of the things. If you were in a, in a more direct seminar, I'll ask you what you would like to do, but because we aren't, we'll, let's see. Uh, we can look at uh, height and uh, body mass in index. We can look at uh, respiratory rate. We can look at uh, temperature, we can look at uh, pulse, and, and um, uh, we can look at um, uh, some respiratory function here, uh, auscultation, uh, some respiratory function. So we know that this person has a, a, a peak expiratory flow, which is uh, a little bit low, 71% of the expected, or we actually should look at 70% of the best value, if you have had a best value before, if you have to look at the expected for uh, this patient uh, considering uh, gender uh, 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 height and, and uh, age. And we can also, can also have a, a FEV1, which is also a little bit below the predictive. So what other reviews do you think that uh, Jane needs? I think you can think about it a little bit and um, then I'll move on to that. And, um, I'll ask you more, more, a little bit more. So let's stay this slide for a little while. We, I want your help to explore which additional assessments and information does she require, uh, Dr. Tiller require, in order to make a decision about Jane's treatment. So you have six options. Look and read, read them. Then we'll go for the televoting and we'll come back to check okay. which one of them. Uh, you, you may already, because I have shared in the chat the, the, the questions some minutes ago, so we already have answers. Let's see. Okay, so, next one. Should you request another spirometry, assess asthma symptoms, confirm the allergy to, to dust mites, assess risk factors, request a chest x-ray, okay. understand Jane's perspective on using inhaler. So, okay. okay. The most answer was B, assess asthma symptoms in the past four weeks, 50% of the answers. Then the second one, understand Jane's perspective using uh, inhalers. And then we have a tie, request another spirometry and assess risk factors for poor outcomes. The least voted option was confirmed the allergy to house dust mites. Okay. Okay, let's go back and discuss one by one. So, request another spirometry. Yes, you could ask another spirometry. Um, but Jane had a spirometry with a positive reversibility test two years ago. In many primary healthcare centers, 
you will have a delayed access to spirometry. So it, you're not allowing Dr. Taylor to manage Jane's asthma on the same day. So if you have spirometer nearby and you can have a test the same day, that would be excellent. Otherwise, for the immediate decision, spirometry could be uh, 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 delayed and ordered for Jane's follow-up appointment and not necessary for now. So yes, it is, it is uh, important to assess asthma, um, uh, 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 asthma gain by spirometry, but we have to, to remember that if you don't have direct access and it's delayed for the immediate uh, decision, clinical decision, I don't think spirometry will be uh, important. But those who have direct access, yes. For those who ask assess asthma symptoms in the last past four weeks, yes, we, we should do that. And um, remember that uh, Jane had daytime, daytime asthma symptoms three or four times a week. She had night wakening. She uh, was unable to walk upstairs due to shortness of breath. Um, she had not had an upper respiratory tract infection. She didn't smoke and she wasn't exposed to smoke. But, and this is very important, she needed to use salbutamol at least twice a week to be able to breathe. And so this is... Uh, remember that Jane was prescribed with a, a controller, a, a fluticasone. She was not using it very often. She was relying on her salbutamol. So this is what I told you in the beginning of the webinar. We should look at asthma right care and remember what is this about over-reliance on SABAs. Uh, remember SABAs are short-acting beta agonists. So uh, we have produced a, a slide ruler, an asthma slide ruler. Uh, that can, this, this version here is the, the one that has been produced by the International Primary Care Respiratory Group, but then the Primary Care Respiratory Society in the UK took it um, with our, of course, because they are part of our movement. Uh, if you look at this link, you can obtain all the information about asthma right care from, from PCRS UK, but can also get it from the IPCRG. The ruler uh, helps us to discuss with colleagues, with pharmacists, with nurses, but also with patients and a patient's relatives about what they think that is the right amount of uh, Sabbath that should take. Uh, there is a, 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 a reverse side which also helps us to discuss this. There are some uh, uh, written instructions you can use and it can help us to start the discussion uh, with patients about what is the, the right amount and what is dangerous and if people consider that they are taking uh, uh, um, Sabbath. Uh, how should we uh, address them about the, the use of Sabbath? The, the whole movement uh, has developed also some question cards. These question cards is like a card deck. You can pick up one card. And with these cards, uh, you, you start challenging uh, questions. And there are some examples here. For example, uh, this is for professionals. What conversation do you have about asthma and Sabbath use? And does the inf the, the, that influence what you're thinking about Sabbath? So you can start the discussion with your colleagues in any CME. Uh, and so I'd like you to vote about this uh, because uh, this question can be converted in, uh, in a set of questions. Can I move forward? Uh, yes, I'm not sure that I put this question in the televoting system. Oh. <laughs> um, no, uh, just a moment. Just a moment, what conversation do you have? Yes, I have it, but uh, in a different order. So I will activate this one. Okay, and now, dear colleagues, please vote in, in the answers of these uh, questions. I think I will share one or two comments uh, while we wait for the answers, okay? You can already show the, the next slide to the answers, yes, and we will wait a, a little bit. Um, Jaime, I was uh, visiting here the website. My God. Great. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Uh, it was worth talking about. The, oh, yeah, well, some delayed <laughs> answers. Don't, don't, uh, if you say the answer, they will change the answers. <laughs> so, no, but I thought it was finished because it was 100%. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> they are voting still. <laughs> so you, you are in biasing the answers. Yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't have shown you this. <laughs> no, I thought it was finished because they were... They were <laughs> okay, I understand you. But um, just a moment. I was visiting the site where we have the asthma rule and I will share another link where you have an interactive uh, form of the rule. So it's very practical yeah. indeed. And uh, um, colleagues, you may 
consult it and uh, try because it has a, a slide button and you can move it forward and back. What does this green part of the rule and the red part, it's a sort of traffic light, does yeah. it? Yes, yeah. so in the green it, part... The more, the more it becomes uh, yellow, orange and red, the more dangerous it is because patients are uh, overusing SAVAs and they are at risk okay. um, of, of okay. a, a severe asthma attack, which is difficult uh, to control. Once people are uh, overusing SAVAs, if you need to have a bronchodilation in an emergency situation, you can't because the, the receptors are blocked, so you can't use it. So it's really dangerous for patients if you're okay. over-relying. Okay. Can I comment this now, or is it too early? Uh, yes, you can comment. So let's now. talk about the ones that nobody answered. I was expecting. I seldom talk to my patients about SAVA use. Happily, nobody uh, chose that. I tell patients to get information about SAVA from the pharmacist. Yes, they could get from the pharmacy, but it's better that we give it ourselves. But I'm working a lot with pharmacists, and we have a, a, a great work with, uh, um, uh, with pharmacists, both in Portugal and international level, and they are really part of the movement, so they are going to be our allies in treating asthma. So you have to also start talking with our pharmacists back, back home and see how we can together uh, curve this uh, situation about asthma care. Then the other one, I don't talk with my patients about SAVA. Uh, users, patients already know what, when to use, so nobody scored it. The majority scored the one that I thought would be the best one. It's to tell patients that SAVA only relieve your symptoms, they don't treat your asthma. Some people chose to say SAVA should only be used for a short time. If you need it a lot, contact your physician. It's also possible, um, but it is better to, uh, to um, have a, a Complete this uh, uh, information by the last one, by the F uh, uh, choice, because it should tell them that it should it, it, use it only for a short time, perhaps not alone, and that we'll see when you look at the uh, uh, guidelines. And then um, I follow asthma guidelines, so t I tell patients to use SABAS for asthma treatment in step one. That was really what was true until um, uh, very recently. And uh, I will show you very soon how, how it has changed or is changing and the suggestions about asthma, uh, about treating asthma in the step one is not uh, anymore to use SABAs alone. So now I can go, I hope I'm not pressing the wrong thing. No, what have I done here? Okay. Okay. And biomass fuels. So all these are, um, uh, and some psychological triggers. Then let's look also at asthma symptoms hotspots. The traditional asthma symptoms, that, as I mentioned, are these chest tightness, breathlessness, wheezing and cough. Um, very often, when we examine patients uh, with asthma out of their um, uh, 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 acute phases, we don't find anything. But during the, the acute phases or when the people are symptomatic, we have uh, breathlessness, tachycardia, audible wheezing. Uh, sometimes the topic findings like rhinitis or eczema is very typical. And people can say that symptoms are often worse at night or in the morning when waking. One of the things that you have to, to, to questions that you can ask, like giving a, a positive message, does this work? If you prescribe a low dose of ICS, it will keep SAVA use down too, and then outcomes will improve. So to remind uh, your colleagues and discuss that um, prescribing ICS together with a SAVA is probably the right, uh, the right choice, the right care. And you can use also some metaphors. Using the blue reliever, so a blue reliever is a SAVA, is like dumping down a fire, but to put the embers out and to stop it flaring up again, you need the ICS controller. So okay, you have a, a, a metaphor, you can use a lot of metaphors. So let's go back to the clinical case, now that we discussed this. Um, and going back to this one, which was also chosen for some of you. Do you need to confirm the allergy to house dust mite? Very few of you did, because we have confirmed it. Um, so we, I don't think we really need to do, confirm it again. Please note that allergic sensitization to a given allergen, a positive Ig test, does not imply allergic disease. Testing for allergy should therefore be reserved for cases where there is a strong suspicion regarding a certain allergen or certain agent. So 
perhaps we don't need to repeat the, the, the uh, allergy testing. Yes, assess risk factors for poor outcomes. We have discussed this. And um, in this case, uh, uh, we had problems with poor adherence. Uh, we can have poor in inhaler technique, but Jane didn't have that. But we had a high, or at least some uh, over-reliance on Saba. So uh, um, poor adherence and, uh, and high reliance on Saba can be a risk. So in a way, Jane can be a, a, at risk. She doesn't have socioeconomic problems, at, at, apparently. And she didn't have uh, a flare-up with uh, intubation and intensive care. But she had, um, had a, one severe exacerbation, not exactly 12 months ago, but... 18 months ago, but she had one exacerbation. So Jane is a little bit at risk and we should be considering that uh, also in, in her assessment. Should we request a chest x-ray? A few of you, but some said yes, but I think we don't need to. A chest x-ray should not be routine in the assessment of asthma and it is not expected to provide any additional information for the clinical management of Jane's asthma at this moment. It was quite clear that her symptoms were due to asthma. We're not considering uh, uh, any um, from from our uh, clinical assessment that she had any any condition that required an X-ray, so it will probably not be an, uh, necessary. And yes, we should uh, try to understand Jane's perspective on on uh, and, and what she expects, her goals, her targets, and discuss with her. Jane was prescribed a treatment which she failed to use for fear of side effects. So this is important. Address her fears. Adherence to medication is a, a, a modifiable behavior and can be improved by having a clear understanding of the patient's perspective and the reasons for non-adherence. If interventions are used to improve adherence, primary care physicians should identify Jane's perceptual and practical barriers so that interventions can be individually tailored. So we need to discuss, not in a judgmental way, we need to ask patient, why are there she here, explain, um, what, for example, people are afraid of using steroids. And we have just to inform that any patient who uses steroids daily in a low and middle dose uh, uh, power for a whole year, take less inhaled, st less steroids into their body than if they go to an exacerbation, uh, to, to an emergency surgery with an exacerbation and take for three, four days oral steroids will take a higher dose in their bodies than they would take for the whole, uh, the whole year by inhaled steroids. And this has been calculated and it can be used to uh, 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 inform uh, Jane about her fears about side effects. So this is um, also explained that over-reliance on, on Sabbath is not uh, treating her, but it's generally making her um, uh, symptoms a little better. So let's review the assessment priorities. We need to check asthma symptoms in the, last, uh, the past four weeks. We have to determine if the patient has risk factors or poor outcomes. And we have to understand the patient's perspective of using inhalers. And checking asthma means using an asthma control uh, test. Okay, now I think we can, before we move on to take some more decisions, we can go and review the case. And to review the case, um, and here I have to try to... It's a little bit far from the screen, and I have difficulty in reading this. Um, Jane confirmed having uh, poorly controlled asthma in the last four weeks, uh, like having daytime uh, asthma symptoms at least three times a week, night waking, waking and needing to use a salbutamol at least twice a week. Jane confirmed having no upper respiratory tract infection in the last four weeks. Which means, why is this so important? Because it means that the symptoms are not due to a, tr a trigger, the most important trigger in asthma, which is uh, upper uh, respiratory tract infections, but it was due to uh, the asthma not being properly controlled. She doesn't smoke and she doesn't, uh, uh, she's not uh, exposed to secondary cigarette uh, smoke or biomass full too. Um, uh, Jane's asthma diagnosis has been confirmed by spirometry. Comorbidities have been excluded. Asthma symptoms have been assessed uh, uh, over the past four weeks. Um, in inhalation technique was uh, being reviewed. Um, the doctor has corrected the minor errors in the inhalation technique. And Jane explained about her perspective and preferences uh, on inhaler. So she likes the inhaler she's using, so she has no problem. 
uh, no problem with costs, the, the, the cost of the inhaler, uh, and no important side effects. Uh, but James believes, fears that expectations have been assessed. So in a way we have done a proper assessment. So let's go and deal with patients with difficult to manage asthma. Just one of the things that I think is very important, we're not going to all of these. This is, will be accessible to you after the lecture, and this can be assessed in the International Primary Care Respiratory Group website with another format. But the IPCRG has developed the simple approach to help us to deal with patients with difficult to manage asthma before we re refer it to a secondary care specialist. Because very often, if we just approach it by looking at smoking, inhaler technique, monitoring, pharmacotherapy, lifestyle, education, and support, and reviewing all that we have uh, uh, done or not done in order to assess uh, uh, if we have done what is needed to, to control uh, uh, the, uh, the patient's asthma, we don't need to refer and we can change a lot of things before uh, and correct a lot of things before we, we need to refer. Or we can identify that we have done everything we could and this patient really has severe asthma and we need to refer to a, to a, a tertiary care center to, for treatment. So just, I mean, this is too long to be read, but it will stay in the slides. And also, um, we need to assess uh, 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 adherence. This is very important because uh, a patient's adherence to their medication is often determined by several uh, uh, problems. The patient's perceptions of illness. So does the patient know enough about asthma? What are their expectations about asthma? What are their aspirations and goals? Many patients have been very bad with asthma, you know, the asthma was really bad, and we treat them and they are better. They could be here, they could be much better, but they are so happy that they are not uh, bad like they were in the past, they, 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 they accept uh, less than optimal treatment, and we can try to show them that uh, they can be better, and also that it, if they don't treat their asthma properly, the disease might progress over time, so it's very important to uh, try to persuade patients and change their expectations and their goals by talking to them and, 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 and getting them uh, uh, on the right side of uh, treatment. There's a lot of beliefs and concerns. There's always the neighbor will tell them, don't take that, uh, that uh, inhaler, it will uh, be dangerous, you'll get used, you'll get addict to it, you'll get used to it, it will harm you. So you have to constantly try to educate patients and relatives and friends about their concerns about treatment. Uh, also, many patients look at asthma like a, an acute illness, so they, they look and say, well, I had asthma last year, but I haven't had asthma, and now I have asthma again. They forget that in between, the inflammation was present, but they didn't feel the symptoms or they didn't feel in such an acute way, and they think about asthma as an acute disease. Uh, and we have to try to, to, to remind them that it's a, a chronic disease. Very often, uh, the, the inflammation is not visible through symptoms. I believe that's really important to yeah. explain because when we explain this to, to, to the patients, they get a better understanding of the mechanism, Absolutely. how it works and how to control a chronic it's problem. It's also good to have one, one of the persons I was working quite recently, the pharmacist I was working with in, a, in one of the teach, teacher's course a couple of uh, weeks ago in Porto, an international teach, teacher's course for uh, 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 pharmacists uh, over uh, asthma right care. He had the three very nice uh, pipes which showed a uh, normal uh, bronchi, uh, an, uh, an inflamed and an acute inflammation of bronchi. And he mm -hmm. was showing these two patients. Please. It works quite well because they will look at something visible, how their uh, bronchi uh, are yes. when, with, with asthma. So we also look, look to, to, uh, need to look at the perceived need and the level of control that patients want to achieve. Like I said, they might not want to, uh, if they have to take medicines uh, twice a day, they don't want to, so, uh, to take, they only want to take once a day, and then it's very difficult, though there are nowadays some treatments you can use once a day. And also f about the context, the past experiences, influences from others, practical difficulties with using the inhalers, when, when to carry them and use them. So this is very important. There are some interesting schemes about adherence that we can consider, and we can look at unintentional and intentional adherence, and unintentional uh, adherence um, uh, uh, non-adherence comes from very often from capacity and resources and practical barriers. So people really want to do, but they don't do it uh, properly. They don't understand. They don't know. Uh, they have the skills to use the inhaler. Intentional non-adherence is people who have 
because of their beliefs, their preferences, their uh, barriers, their motivations. They say, I don't, I'm not going to do like Dr. said. And we have to respect, but we have to try to persuade them to change their attitude. So uh, adherence helps from, uh, uh, from contextual issues, um, from uh, uh, illness perceptions, from uh, background beliefs, through concerns, through the perceived need, and it will condition or limit uh, adherence. So we have to try to impose, improve self-management by working with patients, with information, with education, and with giving them the right tools for uh, self-management. And that is extremely important. And there are some, um, uh, like this health belief model components and linkage that can help us to uh, look at what can be the, the modifying factors, individual beliefs, that can condition actions and are cues to action. Um, so the patient has to understand what are the, 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 the benefits, the barriers, and the, the perceived self-efficiency, um, and also to understand what is the perceived threat before they move to, uh, uh, to action. And so this is not only regarding asthma, this can be used for diabetes, it can be used for any other uh, uh, condition that people uh, need to take in their hands to, to treat, and they have to have a, a high level of uh, um, uh, autonomy and, 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 and be... Um, uh, uh, and so it can be used in some of these diseases, but uh, now I'm talking about asthma, it's a very key uh, element of asthma control, asthma treatment. So, are we now ready to take a decision? I think we are. We have information about the past, the clinical assessment, the physical examination, we review the case, so let's try to move and take a decision about this patient, okay? So, you need to address both non-pharmacological and pharmacological approaches for this patient. So, I'd like first uh, that you look at uh, uh, non-pharmacological approaches, and we have uh, here four options, and I'd like you to uh, consider voting on okay. um, either of them. Okay, dear colleagues, you have... Um, you can help Dr. Taylor to choose the non-pharmacological approaches. The first one would be avoidance of tobacco smoke exposure. Second, check inhaler technique and adherence. Third, in, in, uh, incentivate physical activity and avoid allergen. Just a moment, because once again, the order of the questions is not the same that I have here. And now I will activate the questions. Yes, now you may answer, please. Um, so, uh, meanwhile, while we wait for the answers, I will share one or another questions that the colleagues made so that we can gain some time. Uh, Miguel asks, exercise was not mentioned as a trigger for asthma symptoms. Is it a common trigger? I what did, I what should the it. doctor tell if a patient has uh, an, an exercise trigger to asthma? First of all, I mentioned that, but I didn't talk much, but it was there in the scheme, exercise. So some people uh, get worse uh, of their asthma when they exercise. So if patients, uh, a patient gets her asthma, his or her asthma worse when they exercise, it means that the asthma is not properly controlled. So there are two, several different approaches that you can have. One is that you increase the controller um, doses in order to control. Before the exercise? You increase the, the, the doses, daily doses, well, because usually if, if, if a patient has uh, exercise-induced asthma, he might uh, need to control the asthma better. Okay. Or you can also opt to give a, a, a treatment uh, before, On demand. Uh, before they do the exercise. In the past, it was common to offer a SAVA mm -hmm. before, but now we know that SAVA is not proper mm -hmm. treatment, mm -hmm. so we'll come back to it, and because I don't want to anticipate we're going to talk about okay. treatment. Okay. So we'll come back to it and say, uh, the, the person who wants to exercise and has asthma should be offered uh, adequate treatment that will uh, need okay. a, proper, a controller okay. together with a bronchodilator. Okay. Okay. How we'll discuss it, okay. uh, so keep the question in, to in the... A, in a few minutes. Okay, we already have answers. The most answered was uh, check uh, inhaler technique okay. and adherence, 52% of our colleagues. Then avoidance of tobacco smoke exposure, 28%.
Because uh, our colleagues in the audience only could choose one, um, they chose the one they prefer, but actually uh, what uh, I would say is that uh, all of them are correct. So we should do all of these. Okay, we, we didn't have a chance to vote on the four, you could only choose one, yeah. but they were four correct. So yes, okay. you can choose all of that. Of course, check inhaler technique is paramount. You, you have to do that in every consultation, or if not in every consultation, at least uh, uh, often once a year you should do that, but you should try to do it in every consultation. And eventually, the most important thing is to have somebody in, 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 a, in, in your team, pro probably a, a practice nurse, properly trained practice nurse doing this um, with the patient because uh, you know that doctors are short of time, so somebody else could do the, the inhaler technique check and teaching. It's not only, it's, it's, it's uh, to check if the patient is doing the, the, the technique properly, correct errors, but the, even if the patient is doing it correctly, after some years they will decline in the, they will be sloppy in one of the steps and the, 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 the drug in the inhaler will not be properly used. So yes, we need to, to go to this. Let's look a little bit about non-pharmacological treatment. These are the four most important, not the only ones, but more four most important. Allergen avoidance, smoke cessation and avoidance of tobacco, smoke and other smoke, physical activity, you should incentivize physical activity, and checks of inhaler technique. So these are the most four most important of them. Okay, now I think we should perhaps, we consider what is important in terms of non-pharmacological, uh, approaches. Now let's look at pharmacological approaches. And now we're coming to the more complicated part of our uh, webinar because we'll have six choices. Again, I'll ask you to choose the one, your favorite choice. We'll discuss one by one. Um, there might be more than one possibility and some of them are controversial. I want to bring this as a controversial issue because with uh, GINA 2019, some of the previous things we were doing have changed and we have now other options. So um, these are the six options that you have. Okay, and your colleagues, you may already vote for these new questions. So help Dr. Taylor choose pharmacological approaches, uh, as needed Saba only, low dose ICS with as needed Saba, combination low dose ICS and LABA with as needed SABA, combination low dose ICS for motorol maintenance and reliever regimen, LTRA with as needed SABA, and finally, uh, the last hypothesis, uh, intermit intermittent ICS with as needed SABA. Just for uh, L L LTRA is a leukotriene receptor antagonist, so. Uh, LABA is long-acting beta agonist, SAB is short-acting beta agonist, ICS is inhaled corticosteride. Okay, we may already, we have already some answers and the most answered is the third one, combination of low-dose ICS and LABA with as needed SABA. Is this uh, in accordance with China 2019? <laughs> Let them finish the voting, they're okay. still moving there. Okay. I'm uh, either, so you can choose either of the, 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 the remaining three. I think we should explore this and, um, and, and explain one by one what, what is our option. So, yes, this one is clearly not, okay? This one also, and this one also. So those who didn't now we were uh, we have uh, reduced this to, so our, to three. So our, our colleagues did answer well. Of course. <laughs> so yes, this is an option, and we we have to explore this. Uh, let's try to look at a little bit about this. So low dose ICS with as needed SABA or ICS formatrol as needed could have been the option for that. That's the the, the option there. Uh, Gina step two should be considered as a possible option. J actually, Jane, as I mentioned in the beginning, she was on fritoxone and SAB as needed was typical treatment for step two. What uh, uh, we need to know and remember that the, the recommendation from Gina is that when there is a loss of control, 
either through uh, uh, um, an exacerbation or because of the, the evolution of the, the, the disease, we should start the treatment at a higher step and stay there for a couple of weeks or a few weeks, sometimes until three months, and then step down. You have to remember th that the steps in Gina has always been for stepping up and so stepping down, not only so stepping up. So in this case, we should consider a treatment for step two, step three. And the, the treatment for step three has def different options. Low dose ICS laba for maintenance or as needed low dose ICS for motorol. So you have any kind of ICS laba and then you have ICS for motorol. Why for motorol? Because for motorol has been proved to uh, uh, have cert cert certain properties in terms of quick action and uh, like salbutamol, almost a little bit slower, but almost like salbutamol, and then more sustained uh, action than uh, salbutamol. And because there's a lot of evidence and published evidence showing that if you give either meclometasone with formoterol or budesonide with formoterol, so it's not only budesonide, and I'm quite happy that now we have a lot of uh, companies producing budesonide for motorol, so it's not only one company. And there's in Portugal, there is no IC, um, uh, beclometasone for motorol, only budesonide for motorol, but there are other countries in Europe there is. You can use it as um, the reliever. And it can also use it as a maintain and reliever um, uh, treatment, which is one of the options. So you have it as baseline for example, twice a day ICS for motorol, and when there is an exacerbation of symptoms or at least a loss of control, you can increase the doses and very often you avoid a, 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 a real exacerbation. Okay, so this is um, one of the, the options. The, this, the option that many people uh, uh, chose is accordance with the, 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 the step three treatment for asthma in GINA 2019 or this one too. So these two are the, the best options um, according to uh, GINA 2019. Let's look at GINA 2000, uh, step, uh, step three. Uh, however, Jaime, uh, is still a place, there is still a place for SABA. Isn't it uh, somehow strange if we have these problems with SABA, why does it remain in the treatment options? Because uh, you you only give SABAs, uh, we're talking about SABA in step one for treatment. Mm -hmm. That is the one that should be banned. What the proposal I'm going to show you immediately now mm -hmm. is that in step one, uh, SABA is always given together with an inhaled steroid. Okay, okay. Um, and not given alone. And also, one of the things that we know is that when somebody is exacerbating, it means if they have symptoms and they exacerbate, it means there is more inflammation. If there is more inflammation, you should not give only a bronchodilator, you should give an anti-inflammatory. So whenever a person starts having more symptoms, instead of taking a, a reliever that only relieves the symptoms, you should give a reliever together with a, a controller because if you give an anti-inflammatory drug, the inflammation will be controlled. Okay. Um, all the, 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 the research that has been done by the use of ICS for motorol showed that people will use, use it more when they have symptoms, when they use it as control and reliever uh, treatment, and meaning that uh, uh, if they start increasing the number of uh, time they use it per, per day, they will tend to control, and in never during all the research that has been done with ICS for motorol uh, um, uh, free use, people have ever reached the the the, the uh, uh, limit of of uh, uh, drug used uh, doses that are dangerous. Um, so they have always used it, and because they were using the controller, they tend to control without. Um, reaching the, the toxic doses of uh, formoterol. So it has been quite a good drug in this uh, uh, sense that you can use it uh, either. So this is what is t told about what you should use for uh, children uh, 6 to 11 years old and adults and ad adolescents. So not before 6 years, then you don't, should not use this. And the treatment of choice 
for children between 6 and 11 is for the moment still ICS taken whenever Saba is taken, like I just told you. But this is still off-label. Okay, some of these that have been proposed uh, are approved by GINA. They have been approved in uh, countries like Australia, New Zealand, Brazil and Russia, but they have not been approved yet by the European um, Drug Agency. They have not been approved by uh, the American, um, what is drug agency, the FDA. FDA, not been approved in Canada. Um, so yet, I would say yet because the evidence is gathering and probably in very soon it will be. But it is, it's now very consistently uh, proposed by GINA. GINA 2019 has it clearly set, but already last year they were bringing this as a very probable um, new move. So um, the best thing is to, to move to, to the, the, this um, step, uh, stepwise approach. And here is the, the main change, what is happening here. Okay, so in step one, one of the options is as needed low dose ICS for Motorol. So instead of telling the patient, you should not take a SAVA alone, but here is a SAVA. But you, because you should take it alone, here is another ICS, because in very seldom you have the same in the, in the same inhaler. People, what will people do? They will forget the control or they will take only the SAVA. So you are not, it's very, very difficult to persuade a patient to use a SAVA, an inhaler, when they have symptoms. One of the, the approaches, which is still off-label in Europe, is to give them as needed, low dose ICS for Motorol, and whenever they, they feel symptoms, they will do the inhalation and they are doing the reliever together with the controller. Okay? What is written down is low dose ICS taken whenever SAVA is taken, but I think it's rather difficult. Though now many uh, pharmaceutical companies are thinking about going back to something that existed many years ago but didn't, don't, doesn't exist anymore, is to have ICS uh, SAVA in the same uh, inhaler. So in the past there was beclometazone with salbutamol in the same inhaler. And that could have been an, uh, an option for this, but it's, it doesn't exist yet. This is one of the important things about GINA uh, step one uh, changes. So the other change which is very important is that uh, uh, in step three, you really recommend the use of uh, uh, as needed uh, low dose ICS for Motorol for step three, four, and, 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 and uh, five instead of uh, using a SAVA. But now, again, the preferred reliever is also an ICS for Motorol here. And the next thing that was a very important change in step five is identifying uh, criteria for referring for uh, secondary, I would say third tertiary care for patients who have uh, 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 severe asthma, but also to have criteria for identifying severe asthma. And you have showed how the, 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 the simples approach from the IPCRG can help you to identify severe asthma and try to treat the patient before you refer. So this is um, what we have been trying to, to tell you about um, about the, the new uh, GINA step three uh, treatment and what are the options. And we should try to review the, the, the treatment options before we do a summary and close the case. So the options for Jane are a combination low dose ICS lava with as needed SAV, as some of you chose, and the combination low dose ICS from Motorola maintenance and reliever regimen. So I think these are very good choices, both of them, though, uh, there is also an, an, an alternative here, which is to use uh, any ICS lava, and when the patient needs, instead of using as needed SADA, to use as needed ICS for Motorola. There is a third option, which is also considered by GINA. So I think we are now um, can do an appointment summary here. So after seeing Jane out of the office, Dr. Taylor writes up her thoughts on Jane's appointment. So. Flare-ups, uh, the subjective is flare-ups when Jane has upper respiratory tract infections. Um, uh, and one or two in the last three years. One required treatment with oral steroids and chest tightness and shortness of breath. Usual medication was 125 micrograms of soticazone and salbutamol for relief. Jane uses a lot of salbutamol because she feels better, better adherence to control treatment. 
Jane's fears and expectations were addressed. Modifiable risk factors were addressed. So the objectives was that pulmonary auscultation, there was a slight bilateral wheezing. Spirometry, we reviewed spirometry from 2017, and there was an obstructive pattern. We also know that there was sensitization to house dust mites, so it was confirmed. So our uh, uh, assessment is uncontrolled asthma. So for our plan, there are pharmacotherapy options. Uh, one is low-dose ICS lab for maintenance and as-needed low-dose ICS for Motrol. Two, ICS lab maintenance and with as-needed Saba. Three, consider ICS for Motrol for maintenance and relief. It's very important to review inhalation technique and to promote self-care and patient enablement. And now just uh, coming back to our, our asthma right care. So uh, asthma right care really started as a, a movement for global change. And you can check more about that if you go to the, the ipcrg.org website. So we are talking about over-reliance on SABAs. We have uh, uh, to define what is this, what does it mean that right care? And now our working definitions are that doing the right things and only the right things in the right way for the right people, at the right time, in the right place, whatever that means in the local context. So we have to aim at improving the value that each person with asthma derives from their own care and treatment. It has to do with value in care. And the value of the whole population derives from the investment in asthma, in asthma care, by addressing unwarranted variation. So we don't want, we, we know that there is variation in practice, but we don't want variation that is unacceptable in terms of uh, standards. And also to reduce waste, avoidable harm, and avoidable symptoms. So for that, we have produced slide ruler, we have produced the question and challenge cards, and we are invited to use this slide ruler and, um, and order it from, from IPCRG or from uh, PCRS UK and to use the, the challenge cards. And now I think we are good for questions and I'll address some questions and I'll leave you here uh, also with our references which will be uploaded later. Okay, thank you very much Sam for all your presentation. It was really nice and interesting. Um, so now I'm going to share your questions to, to, to Jaim. Um, for example, um, Buzra from Turkey. Uh, if patient comes in emergency, uh, have to use antibiotherapy? Yes or not? No. When? What, Very seldom. What I, is I, the criteria? I think this one of the things that we didn't mention about right care, about uh, this uh, variation in, in, in care, is very often people with asthma get antibiotics because patients come with uh, upper respiratory tract infection, they have symptoms, and if people uh, 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 address this as a single episode and don't look, at, not, don't look at their past history and understand that there is an asthma history behind that, and for safety, because people are in an emergency service, they don't, are not going to see the patient immediately, very people uh, prescribe antibiotics. Prescribing an antibiotic for asthma should be done very rarely, if possible, we should uh, uh, consider uh, it in, in rare case, but we should treat asthma and asthma not treated with antibiotics. Okay. Another question from Gisela Gaviola from Philippines. Uh, this is good. Ah, I think this was related with Karat. This is good linking asthma and rhinitis, allergic rhinitis. Uh, most of the time, it's treated separately here in Philippines. Mm. Um, do you want to comment on that? Well, what, what I sorry, uh, what I think is that uh, uh, they can be treated separately, of course. But uh, I mean, we don't we don't slice a patient in in, in parts okay. of the body. So, as if a you, if you family could physician, show us the slide of Karat again. I, I was trying to, but it's um, okay. I, I may try to. Yes, if we try to find it because yes, it's. Yes, uh, if you, you can go on sp explaining what. Um, it might not be there. It might be more because they're not sequential. Yes. They are they are jumping with links. Oops. Yes, I think um, it's the. Uh, next. Well, uh, allergic rhinitis is, is uh, uh, also has quite good guidelines and actually we have uh, we have had that uh, let me let Just me try to find it here yeah. oops 
Uh, there it was. Where? Uh, yes, yeah. yes, that one. Um, um, okay. Yes. Yeah. So what we ask in Karat is uh, about uh, nose symptoms um, like uh, uh, sneezing, uh, itching nose, blocked uh, nose, sneezing, blocked nose, itchy, uh, runny nose, running nose, shortness of breath. The, 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 but the first four about the nose. Okay. And then we move on for... Uh, These four are related with... To the, to, with, the, with the rhinitis. Okay. And then shortness of breath, wheezing in the chest, uh, chest tightness, tiredness, limitations in doing daily tasks, woke up during the night is related with the asthma. And then, yes, and then we have one item here which is about uh, the, the, the increasing the doses of, of, uh, medication. of medication. Okay, and um, in your clinical practice, how do you use this tool? Well, do you apply it whenever the patient can? Every time or my only patient, if he has a, 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 a gutization, you know, no. Every case. time the patient comes, it's part of the assessment. It's the same as me measuring a blood pressure mm -hmm. to a patient, and I say that carat is the hemoglobin A1C of asthma. Okay. Because it uh, instead of controlling the last four months, it lasts four weeks. But it okay. tells you about how the patient has been in the last four weeks. So consider it as hemoglobin A1C for asthma. Okay. In diabetic patients, you want an hemoglobin A1C uh, inferior to 7%. Here you want and it here. higher. You want it higher. <laughs> okay. And what's the level? The, 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 the 30 is the, 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 the maximum score. So uh, 24 and over is controlled. And then there is a score there that you can... Uh, okay. And for example, if a patient usually is 23, 22, but he feels okay. It's, it's, uh, uh, the, should the, you increase the medication or not? Uh, if uh, the patient feels okay, we, we have to discuss with the patient uh, about uh, um, the meaning of this, because then we'll check symptom by symptom. So looking at the test, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the answer to the test, I'll see what is annoying. Sometimes it's the nose only. Yes, so we discuss more about the nose. Yes. S uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's the asthma. Okay. But you ask me how I do that. I usually I give this while I'm doing other things in the computer and the patient is sitting, chatting with me. He said, would you mind uh, doing this test again? Because at first I ask the patient, how, are, how is your asthma doing? Mm -hmm. Okay, doctor. How is your nose? Oh, it's okay, doctor. Then I give them the test. Do you mind doing the test? Okay, so I'm doing something else in the computer and the patient answers this in very quickly. The majority of the patients, or my patients already know and they answer this. And they said, well, doctor, I told you that the nose was, was good, but now I realize it's not as good as I told you. Okay. okay. So by looking at their own answer, not mine, mm -hmm. they will realize that they have uh, 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 accepted uh, uh, to be uh, and, and considered to be feeling well, though the nose was. Okay. Um, and do you feel it's different if you put the questions to the patient and feel it in the computer, or if you give the patient the, the it's the, better to the give the them form, actually I give the them paper the, in paper. I do two things. First, I give this uh, during the consultation. Then I tr uh, write the, the, this in the computer, and then uh, I give the paper for the patient. Take this home. And now that we have agreed to change the treatment and improve some, increase some of these doses, check yourself in, in a couple of weeks if you have moved all the, the, the scores from the right to the left, which mm -hmm. means that you are getting better. Okay. So the left is the higher points that you are getting better. And many patients already do that. And there is also an app. I could, well, I, I don't have my phone with him in, me now, but there is an app that you can use uh, for uh, uh, it's the, called Mask Air, Mask with a K, Mask Air. It's, it's an international project uh, uh, coordinated by the uh, um, University of Montpellier in France, looking at uh, rhinitis, but it has also incorporated uh, uh, a an visual analog analogic scale uh, for, um, for rhinitis control. The patients can, uh, can use it, but they can also have uh, uh, a carat incorporated into that, and it has been translated in many languages and is being used in French, uh, uh, English, Spanish, Portuguese. Uh, you, you, we have here a, a, a co colleague, Pavlo Kolesnik from Ukraine. Um, hi, Pavlo. <laughs> and he, he says, We have validated carat in Ukraine 
a few years ago and successfully use it in our practice. Unfortunately, we didn't have the possibility to write an article about its validation in, in Ukraine and thanks to the authors for that tool. Thank so. you. <laughs> well, I, I suggest that you, you contact the, the, the Karat network because it would be good for us to know that it's being used, even if it has not been published at least that people are using and there is one more translation because we have many translations, including many of the languages that are spoken in India, for example, uh, we, it has been translated. Uh, and uh, in, in Swedish, in Finnish, in, uh, well, Italian, um, Portuguese, Portuguese, uh, Brazilian, Portuguese, and so on, many other languages. But it has been uh, formally validated only in some of these countries in terms of uh, a publication with validation. Okay. But the research has been done by, uh, uh, mostly by Portuguese, Dutch, which has done quite a lot of research in cooperation with, uh, with the, 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 the leader of this project, who is a, uh, a allergist from Porto called uh, João Fonseca, who is my partner in many of these uh, activities. And also... Uh, Actually, he's the director of my academic department. Okay, so it's your boss. <laughs> it's your boss. It's my boss. <laughs> and um, João has been working together with the Dutch. They have published a lot of papers. But also, uh, colleagues from, from Munich, uh, like Antonius Schneider and other colleagues from Germany, have also done some publication about the, the German validation of Karat. So um, I think it's, it's, it's really a good tool and I challenge everybody. If you don't have it in your um, languages, which you, you can try to, to do a, 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 translation. a translation and cultural adaptation, but also to do the a formal validation by contacting um, our, uh, Joe Fonseca. He will be very happy, happy to, to help you because we have already all the, all the, the instructions to how to validate uh, it's just a question of, you don't pay, pay any royalties, it's only the question of, or any copyrights, it's only a question of Jean Fonseca knowing and the, 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 the Karat network knowing that it's been used okay. uh, for clinical we purposes. Have more questions. Martina, uh, if you are in an isolated, isolated place where you can't do spirometry to confirm asthma, is it right starting therapy? Um, not only Saba? I agree that it is right. I mean, if I you are... she means it is right to start other therapy yeah, than Saba. I understood, Saba. I understood. Uh, um, I think that if you don't have a spirometry, you could at least try to have a peak flow meter. With a peak flow meter, you can't... Well, the ideal is to have a spirometry. So let me state this for the record. If you cannot... Uh, diagnose asthma by the use of a spirometer. You can try to use peak flow meter. The variation in the, the peak flow before and after uh, uh, bronchodilation, for example, in a person who is exacerbation, is exacerbating, or before and after treatment, you can, for example, measure peak flow, realize that peak flow is low according to the, the, the expectation for this uh, person, and then do inhale steroids for uh, uh, two, three months and do peak flow again. And it, it can confirm your asthma. But it is possible, and it's also said in Gina, that if you are in really low resource place without access to either of these, because the peak flow is not so expensive, you just need to buy the, the, the disposable mouthpieces so that people can use it and then you, you trash it. Um, but if, you, if you're not, not in such a position, you can at least uh, try to uh, check. If a patient comes to your practice with symptoms, you give them a um, bronchodilator immediately, and there is an improvement to suspect it is asthma, or from the clinical point of view, suspecting asthma, you give them an inhaled steroid, a uh, course of inhaled steroid, for example, for three months, and you ask the patient to record the symptoms and it is possible to have a sheet which I usually have to record symptoms over time. And then you check if the symptoms have improved or by doing a karat before and after, you can do it in a clinical way, which is better than nothing. But I would challenge people to try to get proper um, pulmonary function assessment. Okay, thank you. Uh, Salome, um, concerning acute uh, treatment, especially at primary health care. What is the suggested approach? Still using Saba 
I work in Portugal and we only have Saba available in the emergency room, I think she means. Well, for the emergency, we're talking about the, the overuse of Saba as, uh, as treatment for step one, that's by approach. In emergency room, uh, or you still have, can use Saba. The question is that you are, if you are using only Saba, you have to somehow, immediately after, treat this patient. So, if you go on to Gina and look about how to treat exacerbations, or if she's from Portugal, she can look at the Portuguese guideline about treating exacerbation. It hasn't changed. You give them inhaled, uh, uh, inhaled Saba until you control the, the, the shortness of breath, and immediately you start either an ICS if it's available, or if it's a severe exacerbation, you might need to start oral steroid. So by starting oral steroid, you are already giving it a relief uh, controller, but immediately you need to check this patient. When they get out of the practice, they have to have a prescription of an ICS. So <clears throat> what I very often see is people coming out in Portugal and many other countries, but now um, uh, talking about Portugal, with, with uh, out of an emergency service, after an exacerbation, only with a prescription, sort of Saba. So anybody working at an emergency service should prescribe a Saba to take home at release from, from the hospital together with an, an ICS. And also to have a follow-up appointment within 24 or 48 hours with the family physician. Okay, thank you. Um, Gazment from Kosovo. To achieve good control of asthma and maintaining uh, of exacerbations, it's important very much education and skills training. Any activity, it's limitation by asthma control. I, th I think it was more a sort of um, comment yeah. than a question. Okay. Um, Mark, uh, about the air conditioning trigger, what sort of advice do you give to patients with asthma? Is the avoidance no. the only solution or are no. there others? The avoidance should be tailored to each patient. So all the triggers that I showed is not triggers that uh, trigger asthma in every patient. Some patients are allergic to dust house mice but are not, don't have their asthma triggered by other uh, triggers. The majority of the patients will have asthma triggered by a, a respiratory infection. That's common. So that's the most common. All the other triggers might trigger in one patient or not the other. So people have to, to see how, how it affects them. So it's not for everybody. It's for, for those who get, um, like it's very common for people living in very cold countries that, that when they go outside and it's very cold, if they don't, don't do a transition, they might have some symptoms immediately uh, when it's minus and so on. So it, it might have a, a, this effect of sudden um, shortness of the, the bronchi because of the cold. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, we are almost finishing. Dear colleagues, I already shared the link to make the attendance check. And probably <coughs> it's the last question is from Pavlo. Um, I often wonder how long can we safely prescribe ICS for persistent allergic rhinitis? I think he means the mm, <coughs> yeah. sp nasal spray. Nasal spray. Well, as long as it's needed and as long as, as, it, as it doesn't produce too many side effects. If, if the treatment is not uh, with... Uh, the majority of the patients will have to do a course of, uh, of uh, topic steroids for, for rhinitis, topic nasal steroids for rhinitis for periods of the year. Uh, a few of them will need it... Uh, persistently, um, but if, if, if you are not achieving control, it, is, it might be better to refer these patients to uh, ear, nose and throat or to an allergist, better okay. than allergist if when it's available. When you talk about side effects here, we are mainly talking about uh, blood, nose. It can uh, be blood, nose, it, it can be, yeah, it can be uh, some uh, running nose too, mm -hmm. sometimes it okay. can, 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 or the lack of control, or even the fact that if you are giving uh, the nasal steroids, they are also being absorbed. So it, you have also to consider if you have very high doses mm -hmm. that you have to check if you can do something else to control. And so if you have difficulty in controlling, it's better to refer to a secondary care specialist, either uh, allergies or ear, nose and throat. 
Ok. So, dear uh, Jaime, um, we have also some beautiful comments. I'm trying to find them. <laughs> like Irina. Irina uh, said, uh, thank you very much. This webinar was excellent. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Franco uh, Rabi Costa wrote, uh, congratulations, Professor Jaime. Thank you. Marcos from Greece, thank you very much for this webinar. I am on a shift, so I will have to re-watch this, but asthma is a troubled issue for us. Um, we need more training. Um, Maria Bacolda, thank you for the excellent presentation. So, um, in, name, in the name of our colleagues, a big, big thank you for uh, being here today with, with us and uh, for all that you have sh shared with us. Thank you, thank you very much. And I also give you the word to say goodbye to our colleagues. Thank you, Carl, for inviting me. It was a pleasure it to be pleasure. with you and it was a pleasure to be of, of <laughs> use to, to all the colleagues. I just would like to, to, to just address you one last issue. I mean, it, it's, it's so important that we also treat respiratory uh, chronic respiratory conditions, not only diabetes and uh, hypertension like many GPs do. There is a possibility nowadays to work together tightly with the IPCRG. In many of your countries there are primary care respiratory groups. Those that there aren't, you can help us uh, creating them and supporting. There is mm, uh, a big uh, group of support from the IPCRG, including teaching teachers, uh, so that you can then replicate uh, uh, what we we uh, suggest for the approach of uh, respiratory disease. So please join us and also uh, try to improve asthma care and respiratory care in general. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jaim. Thank you indeed. Dear colleagues, uh, we have some good news. Um, we uh, have activated the possibility of individual membership of Europrev. So now, if you want to become a member of Europrev, you may uh, do it. Please, uh, you will find the information in Europref's uh, website. Uh, it's also important for us to grow as a, as a network. During this year, we have been uh, organizing these webinars. These webinars have uh, some important costs. So also the individual membership of the network can uh, help us to maintain this kind of uh, initiative and um, we would be very happy to see our network uh, grow. Our next webinar will be on uh, 26th November. It's a joint webinar with EQUIP uh, and the topic is measuring prevention in your practice. How to do a successful audit. Um, so I think it will be interesting. It will be our speaker will be uh, once again Eva Arvidsson from Sweden. So I, am, I have really a good expectation regarding this webinar. Thank you very much for being there. Ah, and don't forget, next 4th and 5th November, here in Porto, we'll have our annual conference, the Europref Pre Forum on Prevention and Primary Care. So come to Porto and join us during this two days conference. We have, I feel, <laughs> a quite good scientific program, so join us in, in, in Porto. See you all and thank you. Have a nice evening all over the world or a nice day <laughs> if you are in a different time zone <laughs> of the planet. See you, bye bye, until next time. <laughs>